Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. Create a new heart within us. Make us newborn children of your Father. And pour out forgiveness upon your flock so that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. from the 
letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, participants in the Father's parish, and the children forever. Brothers and sisters, before faith came, we were held in custody under law, confined to the faith that was to be revealed. Consequently, the law was our disciplinarian for Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a disciplinarian. For through faith you are all children of God in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free person, there is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to the promise. Praise be to God always. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb. And Jesus answered him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I have told you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes. But you do not know where it comes from or to where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, Now how can these things happen? 
And Jesus answered and said to him, You are a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to that which we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I speak to you about earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I speak to you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have life eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessing to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for He Nicodemus's question. How is a man supposed to be born from above? How is a man supposed to be born again? He's not going to climb back into his mother's womb, is he? It's a blunt question to a blunt lesson being given by our Lord. But the question becomes how? Everyone loves Christmas. Even pagans love Christmas. But the question is what is actually being manifested in wisdom incarnate? Why do we call it the festival of lights Light is about the how. How are these things supposed to take place? What is supposed to happen in my life? How is grace meant to be rooted in my life? None of us could answer a question if it had been asked to you 15 years ago. Certainly I couldn't. If you had asked me 15 years ago, I was where? 15 years ago, I was in Australia. Perhaps even Geneva. I don't know. We won't do the math now. It doesn't matter. But if you would ask me the question, where will you be in 15 years and how will you be serving the kingdom? There is no answer to it because I can't know what is going to take place and I don't know the will of God for next year. I don't know the will of God for tomorrow. I do know the will of God today. And I do know the will of God of where I'm at right now, standing in this church. As each of you do. That's why you're in the pew, because you are present at the divine altar. It's a question of how. How do we take the grace that we definitely have at this moment and apply it? How do we correspond to that grace? You know, St. Isaac of Nineveh, one of his teachings was very much to insist on the fact that we follow God's providence and not anticipate it. It's a great lesson. It's very simple. It's a how. How do we live in holiness? How do we find God? We don't anticipate what God wants us to do, but we rely on following His providence. So last week we considered how this how of God revealing Himself, who He is, not what He is. What He is, you can go stare at Mount Katahdin to know what God is. You can stare at the Kennebec to know what God is. But who He is, this is a personal connection. This is a moment that only He can reveal to us. And if we're not listening, He can't reveal it. That's also a how. How do I participate in the mysteries? 
do I participate in the mysteries? And then so we consider the fact that those who are far from the mysteries become even farther. They become even more remote because they're not proximate and God can't reveal himself in light to them. So the mysteries, and of course, as an extension of the mysteries, our personal prayer life. Do we see our prayer life as being an extension of the mysteries, or are they just something that I do? For Catholic, our personal prayers are meant to be an extension and just simply an application of those participations in the mysteries that the mercy of God gives to us. That's a how. When we ask the question, we look over these weeks, if you notice liturgically, what we do over these weeks of Epiphany is the revelation and the unfolding of the mystery of God as it extends. The first week after the Epiphany was about the revelations of the Lamb of God, of our Lord to John the Forerunner. And so the whole first week of Epiphany was about John the Baptist, the baptism. The baptism is the first time that God speaks who? He is. This is my beloved Son. This is the voice of the heavens. This is the Spirit that hovers over the Jordan which catches fire. That is a who. But in hearing it, it's also a how. How do we respond to a voice like that? How do we respond to this theophany in the Jordan? And so the second week winds up being the revelation to the apostles. So last week, day after day, was the consideration of what is the apostolic office and how our Lord reveals himself to the apostles. In the Gospels, it's always on the calling of the apostles day after day, all last week, and in the readings of the epistles, on what is the apostle doing? What is his how? How is he an apostle? What is supposed to be done? Finishing with reading of the shipwrecks of St. Paul. That's a how. The apostle who goes out and gets smashed on the coast of Malta. That's how the light of God is brought to people. Is it what I want? The smashing of my ship and almost drowning? No. To lose all of my luggage because we're told they throw everything overboard? No. But it is the how that light came to those people on Malta, which has remained to this day. Malta is one of the few Catholic places left in Europe. And yet, it began with a shipwreck. That's an apostle. That's a how. And today, this week, is the revelation to Israel, to the people of Israel and the house of Israel, and then the gospel today with Nicodemus, a teacher in Israel. Now, if we had the next two weeks, as we did last year, because Easter was so late, then the following week is on the how and the revelation, the epiphany to the people of Samaria, the Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritans because they're kind of half Israelites, half Israel, half Assyrians, and so you move again an extension out. But what you notice with each of these extensions, and then the last week, the fifth week, if we had had it this year, would be the revelation, the epiphany, and the unfolding to the nations of the earth. And you'll notice that in our prayers that we have in the Husoyo, and it says, you, the church of the nations, the peoples of the earth who have received this voice, this unfolding of the epiphany, shout with joy, because this light has been brought to you through much blood and martyrdom and testimony and witness throughout the centuries. That's a how. Martyrdom is a how the way that the epiphany unfolds itself to us. And you can be guaranteed that in a culture which is totally becoming profoundly anti-Christian, you're going to suffer a lot. I always tell the young people this. I can't even imagine what it's going to If I can't tell you what's, what's going to be 15 years, I certainly can't tell you what it's going to look like in 2097. But I just know that the way things are going now, it's not going to be very pretty. You see that by the front page news of those who try to make Maine a safe harbor for the slaughtering of children with no restraints. So apparently up to the day of birth. You cannot live in a culture of death and have your ears open to knowing who God is. 
because He is the Living One. And once you have said that life is subordinate to convenience or some other reason other than life, then you cannot hear the voice of the Living One. And this is horrific because you smash the how. And deafness is a profound aspect of that loss of faith. Those who, be, those who are far become farther. It's from the book of the Apocalypse, is it not? Those who are good are to become better and those who are evil become worse. You don't see conversions. And so for us who are in these pews now, it is a great gift because it means that you have heard, that I have heard the voice of God as to who He is and who is all about it. Not about majesty and all that. It's His desire to reveal who He is in the intimacy of persons. This is the mysteries of God. This is baptism. This is why the who of the Trinity is revealed for the first moment in the baptism of our Lord. Our baptism, our chrismation, these are the things by which God speaks to us and puts us on a path of how. But how, how so often has my expectations and my anticipation exactly the thing that Saint Isaac of Nineveh says we must not do is to anticipate the will of God, but to follow what he indicates to us. Prudence means we foresee things, that's a virtue. But anticipation of expectation of the way it really should be, X, Y, and Z down the road, we all do this. And the more intelligent you are, the more you do it. But these are the ways they have to be in place. Which is why some of the smartest people have the greatest disappointments in life. Because they always live in expectations. They've always worked out the way it's supposed to happen next Tuesday. And my sister's going to do this, and my brother-in-law's going to do that, and my child is going to do this, and then you find that on Tuesday, my child does not want to do that, my brother-in-law finds me insolent, and my sister's not going to talk to me for a week. Now, they all have free wills, and so they react to me, and I am totally devastated because of my expectation. Is this not a human scenario? But when we do this with God, it is catastrophic. Because then I have, God will do this, and God should do that, and God should be this way. And the Eternal One from all eternity, the Luminous One who's trying to speak to us, what do you do with that? The sister of that individual, my sister's angry at me on Tuesday because I've assumed all these things about her. And I presume that she will act in this way on Tuesday. So of course she's angry with me. Because I'm not actually communicating with her. I'm imposing on her my expectations. So when Isaac of Nineveh says that we are to follow providence and not anticipate his will, he's not saying just stand there being dumb. But he's saying learn how to receive the light. That's why the festival of lights is about the how. How do we do this? And sometimes the how, as we mentioned, is martyrdom. The loss, the despoliation of all my things, imprisonment. Those of you who are old enough, you remember the great testimony and example that was given by Cardinal Magenti during the Cold War. And the years that he spent living in the American consulate, in refuge in Hungary. He's the primate of Hungary. He's supposed to have everyone dipping and bowing around him. He has nothing. He has a bedroom in the American consulate after having been imprisoned by the Hungarians. That's a how. That's how God manifests his person. And that's why you notice what our Lord says to Nicodemus. When Nicodemus is just scratching his head and saying, what do you mean born again? What do you mean born from above? What the heck is this? Our Lord doesn't just go on to explain. He first pops Nicodemus's bubble. Because he says to him, you're a teacher in Israel. You don't understand what I'm telling you. How is that not possible? I am the fulfillment of the prophecies. I announce to you the kingdom that has been announced for 1,500 years. Remember that when St. Paul talks in this letter to the Galatians, he says the law is a pedagogue to Christ. 
If you read this whole section in chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Galatians, St. Paul originally talks about his conversion and the process of his how, his 14 years in Arabia, his meeting of Peter in Jerusalem, all the things that he went through. Because it's almost 20 years after his conversion before he starts preaching. 20 years. And because of that, he gives testimony of how the how worked in his life. And then he talks about then what's the law. The law of Moses and the law of Mount Sinai was a pedagogue leading us to the Messiah, leading us to the Christ. So what does he mean by that? And that's what I'll leave you with, is to just talk about this one detail of the epistle today. When he uses the term pedagogue, it's a very specific meaning at the time of St. Paul. For us, we have the term pedagogical, and it means a manner of teaching. But a pedagogus at the time of St. Paul was actually a very specific slave, actually. Someone who took care of the children. These days we call them perhaps nannies. In those days it was usually male. And because he was the one who didn't teach the children the pedagogue, but he took the children, specifically the sons, he took them to their teachers to receive their lessons. And so he was very important. He protected the children. This is why in your translation that you have in the bulletin, it says monitor. Or in this one, I think it said disciplinarian. But he's not spanking the children. So disciplinarian is not really a happy choice for a word. But pedagogue is very clear. He's the one who protects the paidos, the boys, the children. And his whole purpose was to take them to the teacher and to bring them back to their household secure. So St. Paul says that's what the law of Moses was for, was to protect a people, to guide a people, to bring them to the teacher who is the Messiah. So you hear that echoed in the gospel today. You're a teacher in Israel and you don't understand these things. Then what are you teaching? How are you guiding? And so the pedagogue had a very important purpose but it was only temporary. Which is why St. Paul will go on shortly after this text and he will say that even for the, the minor, the child, even if he's the heir of all of the estates, he's still going to be treated like, every, like the lowest of the servants in the household. You act up, you get spanked, you get disciplined. The pedagogue will take you. These things will be there. Even though he's heir of everything, he's not yet mature. But when he comes to maturity, he is heir of all. So he's linking it together by saying, but when you were baptized, you put on Christ. You put on the very teacher himself in that light. And in that light, in that transformation, then you are the children of Abraham. And if you are children of Abraham, then you are heirs of the promise of God made to Abraham. It's a very beautiful section. But it's about a how. And we are always being drawn forward in maturity into our spiritual lives that we do not necessarily like. Why do we all love Christmas? And why do you have that cousin who will only come to Christmas Mass and you never see her ever again near the church? Because she's taken refuge in an infantile form of Christianity. She likes the sparkly lights. She likes thinking about Grandma's cookies when she was seven. She likes thinking about all the tinsel and the gifts she got when she was 12. And that's what she's looking for. She is not looking for the Lord Jesus. She is looking for the recovery of her infantile expression of what she calls Christianity. But tinsel and light was not part of Cardinal Magenti. In prison it was. Torture. Being beaten. That was how the light shone in that man's life. These are important questions. And any more than a nanny is going to show up on your doorstep when you're 37 and try to take you out shopping and make sure you behave yourself, which you would find absurd. Though you may love nanny, you may love that woman who gave it, she's no longer your nanny. And so St. Paul says that the law being a pedagogue, it's done. It has accomplished its task. It has brought us to the Messiah. So meditate on these things. This is what Epiphany is about. And this is our last week. Next week we commemorate, we begin commemorating the dead. Those who had a time in this world, who had their heart. 
and who are now in judgment and in, the, in life after death, death. Excuse me. So we prepare ourselves. We ask our Lord on this day that he truly penetrate with us the fire which is light and to teach us the path of Isaac of Nineveh, not to anticipate, but to follow, which means opening our eyes, opening our minds, and opening our hearts, that who God is can be spoken to us, and we respond for the salvation of our souls and for his glory. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Father, love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Timothy. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
filling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim. Holy, 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 mighty Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your great glory. O Son, I can Blessed is he who has come, and will come in the name of the Lord.
Lord, you are the pleasing oblation. 
offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself for you are. You are the high priest who offered yourself as a lamb. Through your mercy, may our fire arise in my incense, which we be offered to your Father through you. To you be glory. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and with holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who Do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo elokurukunna. Amen. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and with holiness, that through them, we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. And with your spirit. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. And make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving love. May our community be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for 
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one, O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins, and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokhodna. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessings of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So there are actually two announcements. One is, with a week and a half's time, will be the Feast of the Presentation of our Lord in the Temple, which traditionally is a day of blessing of candles. <coughs> if you have candles you'd like to have blessed on that day, bring them next Sunday, we'll stack them all up, make sure they're well marked with your name, and then on the fall, I think it's Thursday, will be the blessing of candle mass, will be the blessing of the purification, presentation of our Lord. And we will bless them and you can pick them up on the following Sunday. The second thing is, is you have the collection envelopes for this year, for 2023, that are on the back table. So please pick them out and we can get rid of the table quickly. And other than that, there's coffee and muffins downstairs waiting for you. So go in peace. <laughs>